very much. I, I think that we are, uh, we need to start our study session, so to be on time and so to leave a little break in between uh, the, uh, this session and the next service, and so that we have, we, we are on time. So for those of you who just joined, uh, either online or uh, in the sanctuary, this is a traditional LJS study session on Yom Kippur, in, in between the two services, in between uh, morning service and Musaf, the additional service. And we thought what it, Rabbi Alex and I thought about what to do during this study session. And we thought that the best we can do is to reflect on the past year and to reflect where we are in, in the, as a society. Yom Kippur is a time when we pause our lives for one day and reflect and think about what, what happened during the last year and what happened in our lives. And Maimonides, the 12th century Jewish philosopher and law codifier, um, wrote extensively about the concept of, concept of tshuva. Awake, you sleepers, from your sleep, he wrote. Rouse yourself, you, your, you slumberers, out of your slumber. Examine your deeds and turn to God in repentance. So examine your deeds. Looking at where we are, personally and as a society, is in the core of of the understanding of what the Yom Kippur is, or the notion of tshuva, which is um, traditional, which is the main concept for um, Yom Kippur. Maimonides not only outlined what we need, not, not only articulated the concept of tshuva, but also tried to focus on practical application. How does one com confess, he writes, by saying this, this formula, I beseech you, O eternal one, I have sinned, I have acted pervasively, and I have transgressed before you, I have done thus and thus, and I am contrite and ashamed of my deeds, and I will never do it again. And this, is, this formula, in, in the view of Maimonides, is the core of understanding what a tshuva, what a true repentance is. One, you have to acknowledge your mistakes for yourself and to say, I have acted pervasively, I have transgressed, I have done something wrong, just for yourself, just to say it or to think, think it. The second part, the second stage is remorse. I am contrite and ashamed of my deeds. And the third one is resolution for the future. I will never do it again. Well, this year we decided to focus on the notion of tshuva for us as individuals and as a society and asked three people, three members of our community to speak about what they think people in our society have to repent on, have to reflect on and repent and confess about, both as individuals and as a society. So, and the, the three speakers happened to be three journalists, uh, because the journalists try to be, I think, objective and try to understand what the society is from their perspective. And the first, so the two of them will be on Zoom, so they will join us, we'll see and hear them, but they will be remotely, and one is in the sanctuary. So the first speaker, and I will introduce them all in order before, before each uh, person will speak, and after about seven to 10 minutes talk from all of them, uh, there will be a five to 10 minutes conversation so you can see two microphones in the sanctuary. This is the microphones for you to ask questions and contribute. And if you, um, but just to, there will be time and I will try to, um, I will try to explain um, 
how it's going to work because some of the questions are going to come on from Zoom as well because I believe that there are people on Zoom. So if you would like to ask a question, uh, please uh, either indicate it in the, just stand next to the microphone, this way we will know if you're in, the, in person, or raise your hand on Zoom or send a message on Zoom, this way we will know. If you would like to ask a question on the YouTube, <laughs> so that's uh, also possible, just write it down on the chat and uh, this way we will, I will, I will be your voice for those for people on Zoom. Uh, there will not be enough time for all questions probably, but hopefully we will cover some of them. Okay, and our first speaker is Eve Simons. She's a writer, a journalist, and currently deputy health editor for the Mail on Sunday newspaper. Health editor. She is also the author of the book Eat It Anyway, which aims to help foster a positive relationship with food, celebrating anything edible. And uh, her own note in the brackets was even gefilte fish. So, Eve, it is up to you. Hello there. Thank you so much for having me today. It's such a privilege. Um, so, uh, yes, uh, thanks, Igor, for the introductions. Um, I am a journalist, I'm a health writer, an editor, um, and for the past six years, I have campaign campaigned for people with eating disorders, um, specifically um, with regards to helping, I'd say, mainly young women uh, overcome fears about food and anxieties and try to have more of a positive body image. Um, so I'm just going to talk a little bit today about um, I guess what I view, uh, where I view society could improve um, and in preventing these kind of illnesses um, and also what I've learned in my recovery. Um, so I met myself six years ago, um, was in a hospital. Um, I was unable to walk outside, uh, enjoy a meal alone or even open a window. Um, I was diagnosed with anorexia um, and was so unwell uh, that I was at the point where my organs were actually shutting down. Um, I was, I was, I'd say, in denial about that for about a year before this point um, and just thought that I could eat and everything would be fine. I'd just treat myself by, by eating and, and it would be okay. And of course, anyone who knows anything about mental illness, serious mental illness, knows that that's, of course, not not the case and you're not actually in control of your behavior even if you think you might be um and i realize now which i have, have written about since um in my career as a journalist and also um in my book uh, which igor mentioned um i i became a, a, a awake to all of the messages that were around me about food and dieting and bodies and how they were having a very negative impact on my sense of self and had massively contributed to me spiraling down this um uh, down this path um and becoming very unwell um i got particularly invested in um recipes that suggested uh, swapping carbohydrates for vegetables. Um, I was very into making brownies with courgettes and sweet potatoes. I don't know if anyone's tried that, but I wouldn't recommend it. Um, and uh, and uh, I realized that all of these messages were so normalized uh, and it became very easy for me to disguise my behavior to those around me. Um, so how did I get back from ending up in really the lowest of the low? Well, it took six weeks in a hospital unit, um, and I, I got lots of medical input, which anyone with uh, a clinical mental illness should get. Um, it's obviously absolutely vital, but I realized quickly that that was only one part of the picture. Um, so the first thing that, that I needed uh, to get out of this position was knowledge, um, a great amount of knowledge. Um, and I realized that by writing. So I started writing about my situation and about the realizations I'd come to about all of the messages and the sort of toxic culture uh, with regards to diet and body image. And I found that the more I wrote about it, the more I had feedback from other people in similar positions who said, this is me. And I didn't realize that these messages were, were making me feel this way, but they are. Um, so 
in doing that, I then started researching uh, feminist food theories and um, I read lots of Susie Orbach and I um, became very interested in a, uh, a kind of political feminist analysis of women's relationship with food and their bodies. Um, and that knowledge filled me with, well, anger for one, um, because I, I, I understood now that all of these messages that had affected my health uh, were wrapped up in decades and decades of a patriarchal society um, that were telling women that they weren't good enough or that they um, had to be different from the way they naturally are um, or restrict their boundaries and, and restrict their bodies. Um, so uh, that kind of gave me some fire um, and, and also it, it made me want to understand for other people who are in that situation and to um, enlighten other people with uh, the, the roots of these messages um, so that they can maybe be a bit more uh, knowledgeable about um, and curious about things that they might see um, to prevent themselves from becoming uh, warped with all of these, uh, these things that are out there. Um, I'd say also, uh, as part of that, I launched a website called Not Plant Based, which was a community for people with eating disorders and also disordering. Um, and that's been running for about six years now and uh, has busted lots of diet myths, um, looking at everything that you ever thought you knew about diets to try and really understand what the science is behind diets um, and, and different, uh, different areas of nutrition. Um, to try and address some of the prevailing myths that are around there about uh, that are out there about nutrition, um, and that proved very popular. Uh, we've now got a community of about twenty thousand people. Um, a very popular uh, Instagram page. Um, if anyone wants to follow, it, it's at not plant based. Um, and I started to realise how how huge a problem this is. Uh, there's about 1.25 million people um, in the UK who have eating disorders, um, but those are only the diagnosed clinically, clinical eating disorders. Um, there's millions more who struggle with disordered eating or problems with their body image. Um, and so uh, I've, I've begun to kind of understand all of those, those things that we might say in conversation and how they can affect um, everybody's sense of self and their relationship, not only with food and, and appetite, but also with other people and um, and with their own uh, sense of, of their body um, and, and well, kind of wider confidence. Um, the other thing that I would say uh, I have learned that it takes to get to a point of recovery, which I, I thankfully can say six years on, I, I am definitely at that point, um, is a village. Um, and uh, that means uh, supportive people who um, install messages of really listening to your appetite and your desires and um, your true sense of self, um, uh, you realise that um, there are unfortunately people who uh, you may surround yourself with that may be um, un unknowingly um, broadcasting messages that aren't particularly helpful. Um, and I think that especially young people, especially young women, are very vulnerable to messages that are on social media, etc. And it's really important to surround yourself with people who uh, love you and care for you as, as who you are and don't try and change you. Um, so that's another thing I've learned. Um, and the third thing is inspiration. Um, about three years ago, I had an idea that um, having worked with lots of people with eating disorders uh, and, and problems eat, with eating and anxieties about food, I learned that one of the most important things that I had seen have a huge effect on helping people to eat more peacefully um, was being surrounded by people who eat that way, who eat what they want to eat, particularly women um, who, who don't kind of have a slice of cake and then make apologies for it afterwards. Um, and so I came up with the idea to um, create a supper club for people with eating disorders and problems with eating um, and kind of have a group of people who perhaps had had, had had a similar problem to me and then also have a group of people who uh, understood the condition and perhaps had a history but were recovered and now ate what they wanted with abundance um, and that inspiration I felt would be transformative um, and uh, in the first supper club I, I saw this for myself and it was it was almost like magic uh, there were girls there who told me they hadn't eaten for two weeks were very very sick um, and slowly, slowly, when they saw other people um, who understood their 
problem and who had great sympathy and empathy for them eating what they wanted, they felt more comfortable to, they felt safe to. Um, and so I carried on doing those supper clubs. Uh, we did about four of them, very successful. And, uh, and I, I hope to do more in the future. COVID unfortunately hit, which has thrown all of our plans um, out the window, but um, hopefully uh, we can pick them back up at some point in the future. Um, so I guess, uh, you know, with regards to, to uh, Yom Kippur and today, I um, would uh, encourage everyone to think about the messages that they might put out there, the subtle um, inferences that they might be installing in other people's minds without even realizing it, um, about not just about food and body image and appetite, but um, about everything, uh, and and realise that although something might not feel um, important or uh, worthwhile considering for you, for another person, they take that very differently. Um, we're in a situation, unfortunately, now where we have rising numbers of people, especially young people with mental health problems, and not enough capacity to cope and to help them. So we all have a duty to do our little bit to prevent conditions like eating disorders. Um, I would say that I feel today deep in my bones that I have recovered, um, and I'm, I'm very lucky and happy to have done so. Um, but I maintain that I'll always be a work in progress um, but right now, I think for me, that's, that's enough. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much, Eve, for, first of all, for sharing. And it is a very personal story that you shared. It is not only your activism that is inspired by some abstract knowledge and the uh, problems and issues of, uh, in our society, but it, it started from you. And uh, I just want to say thank you for sharing. Uh, if anybody would like to say anything, to comment, to ask a question, uh, please, there's one microphone, if you can please go there. Uh, sorry, Ariel in, this, in the synagogue uh, has a question. Hi, uh, I'm not sure you can see me, but thank you so much for sharing your story. I'm uh, currently in recovery from anorexia. Uh, I can't fast today, and I think it's hard uh, during Yom Kippur, and uh, yeah, I I wonder what what's your thoughts on Judaism and fasting and eating disorder, if you're comfortable with sharing. Thank you for your question, and I'm sorry that you've had to go through that. Um, it's actually, it's funny you should say that because I'm currently researching a project um, and looking at the kind of the, the, the deepest, darkest reasons why women in particular, um, but also some men have a um, complicated relationship with food. And uh, one of the main themes is religion. Um, and uh, interestingly, I've come across some research that shows that especially in the Orthodox community, eating disorders are particularly rife. Um, I think that it's a uh, very, there's many complicated reasons why that may be, but I do think that um, the majority of eating disorders happen in women. Um, and I think that there is a, a lot to be said about rules and restrictions that um, confine women to a certain life that perhaps they feel they don't want, and they may feel that things are out of their control. Um, and as far as I'm concerned, eating disorders have always been um, not about food, not about body image, but about control. And often they strike at a time when um, everything else in your life feels unstable. Certainly that was true for me and, and is for a lot of people I've met. Um, and that they, they're a sort of um, uh, uh, a method of focus and, and something that you can, a concrete thing that offers some sort of stability that makes sense in a time when nothing else does. Um, so uh, I think also I know that, that, that Yom Kippur is very difficult for lots of people with eating disorders, and um, I'm sure Igor would be able to tell you more about this than I would, but I know that there is, you know, something about uh, you should only do it if it is um, in keeping with your, a positive thing for your health. Um, and if there are any health indications, then, then of course it's not, not appropriate. Um, and and I, I also worry about the kind of... Um, fasting trends that are going on at the moment in uh, in modern society because uh, I don't think that they're particularly helpful for people with eating disorders either. Um, but thank you for the question and uh, wishing you the best of luck. Thank you. Yes, thank you. Thank you again.
Um, so people on the YouTube just very grateful to your contributions and they, they, they just say that very grateful to join in and thank, and they thank you for, for your wisdom. And of course the laws of, uh, cash, laws of fasting uh, are very clear in Judaism that if fasting can cause you any damage or it, it can lead to any harm of your body or mind, then you, it is not your choice. You just simply should not fast. It's a commandment not to fast if it leads to harm. And that's, uh, I think, a very important message to put out uh, as well to people in the sanctuary and uh, everybody. Um, so fast is not fast for the sake of fasting and competition with others. Look, look! I am such a good Jew. I fast longer than others. I think that's not really the fast that is intended intended in, Jude, in Judaism. Uh, Eve, thank you so much for your talk and for agreeing to be. And I know it's a very busy day for you, for uh, because it's uh, at the end of the week and it's. Uh, newspaper that goes on, on, on the weekend. And I, I believe that we have one more contribution question. Not sure whether I speak with or without the mask. <laughs> this. I, I think that we have the rule, if you speak, then you can remove mask and microphones are uh, far uh, away. Okay, thank you. I'm someone who's perhaps, I have a, an eating disorder, but a different kind the sort that if I, that I eat too much, and Hank can be very, very big. Um, and so for me, when I think in terms of Yom Kippur and food, I think of, I need to get better control over my food, I need to resolve not to overeat, and all those things. And I'm really grateful hearing your message, because it's one that I've certainly thought about a great deal in between thinking about the latest diet and <laughs> regime and how I'm going to lose weight. And it's an incredibly difficult thing for someone that does have difficulties with food that for me, it hasn't been at the anorexia end, although many, many decades ago, I had a small phase of that when I was young, but mainly it's how to balance and regulate what I eat. And I find that really, really hard. And it is another side of the same coin that it, you know, disordered eating, um, which I think maybe other people might relate to as well. It's difficult because it's, ah. you know, you're trying to control something, but at the same time, it's going into all those messages. Absolutely, absolutely. And um, actually, there's a big misconception, you know, uh, I think it's something like 60% of eating disorders are not anorexia. Um, and most people with eating disorders are a pre present at a healthy weight or, um, or, you know, are overweight. Um, so actually, uh, anorexia is only, any, as you said, one very, very small portion of the problem, to be honest. Um, and, and I think that you'll be surprised, well, you might not be surprised to know that there, there's many, many, many people out there who would tell exactly the same story that you do. And for me, I, I find it personally quite heartbreaking because I think that how have we got to this point where so many women spend most of their life not thinking about the things they can achieve, the things they want to do, the way that the ways that they can be fulfilled in life, but about their body and about how they can lose weight. And it's such a kind of arbitrary thing. You know, if you were to chop off your arm, you would lose weight. Um, is it that important? And there is obviously health implications, but I think to a certain extent, what we know that is very harmful for um, long-term health is, is yo-yoing. So putting a lot, lot of weight and then losing a lot of weight. Uh, and actually, you know, if, if, if the kind of the best thing for you to be able to get rid of all those thoughts and that noise in your head is to just kind of make peace with, with the way that your body is and the way that it sits. Ah, unfortunately, we are losing the signal, Eve. I'm sorry. I think that... Of course, you know, if, if people want to improve 
their health and, and one way of doing that, perhaps if, if they've been advised to by a medical professional to, is to lose weight. Um, there are ways to do that, but um, in a kind of in a in a much more uh, balanced way. But I do think there's also something in accepting the way that you are and being absolutely fine with it. You know, there's nothing wrong with you. Um, and I'm sorry to hear that you have you have gone through that. But um, I would say that you know that there are uh, obviously many many eating disorders that aren't just anorexia. Um, and if you're thinking about food a lot all the time, that there, there is help out there. Thank you, and I'm aware of time, and I know that we have one more, would you like, one more contribution, and that will be our last contribution for, for, for this time, for this uh, talk, and uh, Roy. Now, I just wanted to say that I think a big part of this is that diets are a business, and uh, I used to work with Jamie Oliver where we worked on, on uh, obesity, but we did a series called The Men Who, Who Made Us Thin, and the amount of money being made out of dodgy diets, and you know, I don't know if they're particularly bad, but you know, Weight Watchers is one of the few companies who, who do extremely well out of people going constantly to pay money to do these things. I think it's very important to be aware that a lot of people are making money out of this. Thank you, yes, absolutely. I'd be the first person to completely agree with you, and I work at a newspaper um, where um, you know we see that every time there's a diet on the front page the sales go through the roof so I think it's a cycle as well that people unfortunately want diets and it's because they've been told for decades that it's going to change their life and it's going to make them you know that whatever they want to happen in life will happen when they're thin um, and that's not something that we were born to think obviously it's not natural it's something that we've been fed by people who are in a, the business of making money off that message um, and it's going to take uh, a long long time to kind of reverse those those messages and try and um, install a greater sense of self in people so that they don't have to rely on uh, the external voices that um, don't have their best interests at heart. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eve, and I think that we all are very grateful for you. I am aware of time, and I, I am determined to start the next service on time and leave at least 10 minutes break. Unfortunately, it means that to, I will have to be a bit more strict uh, with the timing for questions for next question for next two speakers, but there will be time, don't worry. It's just not as, as much time as we would all want to. Um, the second speaker uh, for us today is uh, Turi Muntha. Uh, he's a journalist and entrepreneur. And Turi, excuse me if I will make any mistakes in introducing you. Um, you uh, Turi has founded several media companies, including uh, Demotix, uh, which became the world's largest network of photojournalists. Uh, he's a partner at North Based Media, and his latest project is called Parlia, an encyclopedia of opinion, where uh, where Turi tries to to map out or understand how the world thinks. Thank you, Igor. Um, after that, very moving. Can you hear me? Okay, better. Better? Can't hear a word? Yeah? Fantastic. Um, after that very moving talk from Eve, for which thank you, and these very moving contributions from the congregation, I'm going to be talking about something a little bit more dry, but, um, but also, I think, important. Yom Kippur, of course, is a time to look back to analyze what we might improve to get back on the right path. I've spent the last couple of years thinking about the state of civil discourse, about the ways in which we talk to each other, the ways in which we apprehend the various different sides of the aisle. I'm very grateful to Rabbi Igor for letting me talk with you a little bit about it, but as I think we're all aware, it has not been a pretty picture. I suppose 2016 Brexit here, Trump in the US, sort of set the tone for this accelerated polarization that we've been in. But even ignoring that, if we think about the degree of rage that a conversation about masks can, um, can suscitate across the UK, we realize that we're in 
These are angry times. These are polarized times. We've argued before, of course, I think of the 1960s in America, a time of tremendous political and cultural upheaval, the 1970s in the UK, which pitched um, flower power, uh, free loveites versus old-fashioned um, conservative lords. But um, today's rage, today's anger, today's fight across the fence is of a slightly different nature, so the social scientists tell us. It's more febrile, it's more angry. And let me give one example to, to sort of show how. Back in the day when our parents worried that we were going to marry out, marrying out meant marrying outside of one's religion or one's ethnicity. Today, more than half of British and American parents, I have the data, um, are worried about their children marrying out politically. They're worried, distraught about the notion, not that a Jew might marry a Gentile or a black person might marry a white person. They're worried that a Democrat might, worry, might marry a Republican or the other way around. In other words, politics, which used to be all about ideas and used to be all about revolution in the streets but was never spoken about at table, politics has become political. Sorry, politics has become personal. I appreciate we're halfway through Yom Kippur and some of us are hungry, so I shouldn't probably push this button, but think of things which have really got your goat. Issues which hit you to your core. I named a few of them earlier. I'm sure you can think of them. On issues that we truly care about, which touch on our bedrock values, when we meet the other side, we don't just think they're wrong. We think they're somehow morally or intellectually corrupt. We think they're malign. We can't even quite believe that somebody could hold the opposite opinion. And this is where the breakdown happens. This is when the political becomes deeply personal. And it's terrible for society, and it's, it turns out, terrible for democracy, as we've seen in recent election cycles in the US, in the UK, very much across Eastern Europe, and it's also terrible for family dinners. So how do we deal with it? I've looked at all sorts of different potential solutions to this, and they range from going out fishing with members of the other political tribe, or stopping to talk about politics altogether, um, changing our constitutions and our political setup so that we don't have two parties, but lots of different parties. There are lots of suggestions about how to deal with it, but I think the thing which has hit me hardest over the last we while that I've looked at it, is I think we need to change the way that we think about our personal values. The more I've tried to understand opinions, where they come from, the more I realize that these beliefs which I think of as deeply mine, as making up who I am, they're not really mine at all. Or they're mine in the same way that my nose is mine, or that my slightly balding hairline is mine. They are me. But did I ever really choose them? Do I have responsibility for them? Did I sweat for them? Do I in any sense deserve them, or deserve to call those opinions mine? An obvious example. For all of us here, on Zoom, on YouTube, and here, our Judaism is an important element of our identity. But did we choose it? For most of us, that identity is inherited. It's in our blood. And here's what's interesting. A whole lot else is in our blood. Siblings tend to share politics and values much more than strangers. Okay, they were brought up in the same environment, same culture at home, same parents, maybe the same schools. But fraternal twins share politics and values more than siblings do. And identical twins share values and politics more than fraternal twins do. In other words, a fundamental element of ourselves, our values, our deepest, most important core beliefs, are actually possibly genetic. And here's another truth, that this left and right split that we see in Parliament or in Congress 
and we kind of take as possibly arbitrary. In fact, that left-right split is universal across almost all cultures, all civilizations, and we think also across history. In other words, we had long-haired um, progressive ancestors and conscientious conservative ancestors fighting it out 30,000 years ago in our caves. The left, that left-right split in politics is universal. So it's actually human nature that varies depending on what side of the divide you're on. Okay, so why is this relevant? And well, more importantly, how does it stop us pulling society quietly apart? What this tells us is that we've evolved our tendency to the left and to the right. And like everything in evolution, we evolved left and right because it helped us to survive. Imagine two societies 30,000 years ago. We'll call them conservatopia and liberalia. Conservatopia is uh, extremely well run, organized, terrified of foreigners and outsiders, hierarchical. How is that society ever going to evolve if it's never going to encounter new ideas? We'll never meet anybody from the outside to help trade with them, to do whatever it might be. Now take liberalia. Everything goes, everything's easy, make love, not war. How does that society survive when they meet the first tribe that actually does kind of want to go to war? Early society needed its conservatives to worry about outsiders and make weapons, I'm oversimplifying. And it needed its progressives to scout for new lands, trade with neighboring peoples. We ev have evolved to be a mix of both left and right because that's actually what makes us successful. In a profound sense, we're not that different from ants and bees. We have our scouts and we have our soldiers. We need the other side. But I want to go one step further and ask a question that maybe you've been thinking about here, which is, if for society to survive, we need real variety, we need left and right in their most basic terms, why can't we contain those left and rights in ourselves? Why can't we, when faced with a complicated problem, why can't I activate my left-wing brain and then activate my right-wing brain and then come to some reasonable conclusion? And here the answer is a little annoying but fascinating. And it's because, actually, we think better when we argue. We've evolved to argue, just as we argue to evolve. You all know Wikipedia. Wikipedia is a giant site which is built by a network of thousands, tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of, of volunteers who write it up together. It turns out that the very best pages on Wikipedia have been written by the most polarized teams. The one unique feature of humans, the thing which differentiates us from our chimpanzee and bonobo cousins, the thing which got us down from our trees and made sure that we weren't massacred in the savanna, that thing is cooperation. It's our cooperative capacity. That's our unique selling point, our killer app, our unique feature. We have to think of argument as cooperation. Argument is cooperative reasoning. So let me wrap with two comments. One, Leviticus 19, 18, you shall not take vengeance or bear a grudge against your kinsfolk. Love your neighbor as yourself. The most basic of Jewish injunctions, the golden rule, to all the other good reasons for trying to follow that rule, I want to add one more, which is this. You must love your neighbor. I must love my neighbor. That neighbor I can't bear, whose politics I abhor, whose values I think stink, I must love that neighbor because that neighbor is me. You must love your neighbor because your neighbor is yourself. Humanity is a collective. Without them, no you, without you, no them. And the second thing is this, that as counterintuitive as it may seem, we must also love the argument, love the fight, because that's how we, the collective that is humankind, 
thinks best. And what's so extraordinary about this is that it's an argument that we must never win. This is an argument which must go on forever, like an infinite game which will have no victor. Because to win the argument is to stop thinking. Unfortunately, we only have time for two contributions and questions. And uh, is it okay if I ask you to come to that microphone? Yeah, yes. Thank you so much. I, I, I'd actually love to hear it again. And almost every sentence I wanted to go something, I wanted to say something. So I'm, I'm slightly buzzing. So that was, that was really fascinating. Thank you. Um, some of what you've said just led me to think about complexity and um, the difficulties that we have in dealing with complexity, even the, uh, the binary business about left and right. You know, it's, no, it's never that simple, is it, really? And, um, but we make it that simple because it's much easier to, to deal with. And so I'm wondering what your thoughts are about our capacity, our genetic, I'm, I'm the, the evolutionary bit and the, the genetics were the biggest um, thing for me to, to want to question. But I would rather not question. I'd wonder, through those um, disciplines, how, how have we developed and how can we continue to develop our capacity to deal with complexity? What a tremendously brilliant and difficult uh, question, thank you. <laughs> um, as you were talking, similar things started buzzing around my head. Um, but let me go back to something that Rabbi Igor said last night. He talked and he said that the, um, when uh, the gates of prayer close, the gates of tears remain open. And I started thinking of it in the context of um, this, the argument, the fight. There's something um, over these last 18 months that all of us, I think, have lived through, which has been tremendous difficulty in various diff different ways. Incapable of meeting people, inca incapable of, uh, of connecting in the ways that we did. Actually, that acknowledgement of the difficulty, the acknowledgement of the pain, perhaps even the pain itself, that gate of tears, allows for some absolutely fascinating, rich, complex conversations with oneself. So perhaps, in terms of talking about complexity, everything I just said about left and right and our Paleolithic ancestors, perhaps all of that we could turn inwards and think about the various different tribes we hold inside ourselves. Um, and perhaps there's an element of, I suppose the thing which I take away from this is that um, lots of wonderful things come from an acceptance of contradiction, an acceptance of conflict, an acceptance of things not quite fitting all in the same box. I'm going to be really cheeky and be very quick because I just wanted to add. So we also live in a climate, I mean, I totally agree. What Jewish table doesn't have tons of argument going on? You know, it's fundamental. But we're in a, we live in a climate where argument is really being censored, left, right, and center, where there's no platforming and all that kind of thing. And we're not given the opportunity to practice. We are staying within our bubbles, retreating within our bubbles to quite an extent. And, and so I'm also just wondering how we encourage what you've described as argument as the notion of you know, cooperation, that that's actually trying to reach out Argument as in dialogue, I guess, really. It's one, of the, it's one of the great fights of today. One of the great, I mean, the center of our culture wars is precisely this. How do we reassert all the good bits of liberalism, which require engagement with all sides, while being aware of the very, the very, very many people who felt excluded by the type of discourse, the language being used for that liberalism to take place? How do we make that liberalism so big that those people who would like to close it down, close universities, deplatform speakers, cancel intellectuals, etc., feel that actually it's not in society's nor their greater interest to do so. Um, unfortunately, I'll have to um, draw this talk to a close as well because I'm aware of time. 
and introduce our third speaker. And I do hope that we will have many more opportunities to discuss this topic and many more topics. And yes, sometimes to disagree with each other. And the third speaker I would like to introduce is uh, Eleanor Ross. And I forgot my page. Um, Elena is a journalist, author and communications person for the United Nations, who has recently written a book on the myth of success called Good Enough. Uh, this book explores the myth of um, meritocracy and the standards society holds us to when it comes to what success means. And uh, I've yeah, I started to read this book, and I think it's uh, it, it's worth uh, it's worthwhile reading. And uh, Eleanor, please, uh, it's yours. I am aware of time again, so we will have a talk which will last about seven uh, minutes, and then we will have one or maximum two contributions as well. Thank you so much, Igor, and thanks for your kind words about my book. I will keep it short. Um, I think I'm actually probably only going to speak for about five minutes maximum. Um, so I just wanted to start off uh, by asking you the question just to consider while I speak. Uh, what's wrong with the notion of being average? Is there a reason that we as humans can't accept that we are actually all bang in the middle? Uh, very few of us are right at the one end of the spectrum of being the best at washing up or right at the bottom of the spectrum of being the worst ever of washing up um, or, you know, academic success or being the best or worst parent. I don't think any of us probably fall into the best or the worst category, which makes us all average. So why is success so fundamental to our personalities? Who are we without success? Is average really such a dirty word? Um, I started thinking about this question uh, after I had a, like Eve, also ended up in hospital, uh, but for a very different reason. Um, I had a, a breakdown because I was burned out. I was so burned out because I was trying to prove that I could do everything. I was trying to prove that I could be the best at going to the gym. I mean, who cares? The best at holding dinner parties, the best at being a great friend and being there for everyone all of the time, the best at work. I'd stay late. I'd stay until past midnight most days just to be available to support my team. And while I don't think there's anything fundamentally wrong with doing any of these things some of the time, if it makes us happy, that's a lot of caveats. I think there is a cycle that many of us get into where we start making ourselves overperform because we are a little afraid of being average. Now, just to go back to that day, it was two and a half years ago, so it was actually quite recent that I ended up in hospital. I was so burned out, I couldn't walk. I couldn't lift my arms. I remember sitting on the hospital bed. I managed enough energy to cycle to King's College Hospital, and I just was stuck. And of course, everybody immediately recognized it as burnout, because being so close to the city, I imagine they see people like me all the time. People who, I was a journalist, I was working double shifts. But the thing I want to just ask you right now is, why don't we put ourselves first, mentally, more? I call it the oxygen mask situation. You, airplanes have got it right. You put your own oxygen mask on for helping others. And yet we don't do that day to day. We don't reach for our own safety blanket and figure out how to get through our day. We're always trying to make ourselves as available as possible for everyone else. And I think, and I'm, I'm loath to gender this, but I, uh, studies do show that women tend to feel more stretched. We do do more childcare on average than men. And we do tend to volunteer more at work, for example, in terms of note taking, becoming the office secretary, all these, all these elements. And I think it's time to say we're good enough as we are. I just want to bring one other thing in, into this discussion. I, th I think it's a very important time to reflect on the ways we can help ourselves help others. So we help ourselves before we extend our mind, our strength, for those around us as well. It's vital, otherwise we're not going to survive. 
And what's important, I'll just touch on this, and I'm interested to hear any thoughts maybe in the YouTube chat, which I'll definitely check after, but whether there are ways, even just think of some of the ways that we have become so competitive without really knowing or realizing it. Things like, we don't just bake a cake to relax anymore. If you become a good baker, someone goes, oh, you should apply to Bake Off. If you're good at sewing, oh, there's a great British sewing bee, put an application in. Even, I was just thinking about this, even the Antiques Roadshow, it's about having a valuable item rather than just seeking pleasure and joy in its aesthetic quality. And I think one of the things that makes me laugh, and I wrote about this in my book, is how competitive we are, and I'm sure we've all done it, about how little or how much we sleep. What a bizarre thing to be competitive about. I do it too. Oh, I only got four hours. I'm exhausted. It shows how great you are, right? It shows that you can just keep pushing, that you're indefatigable. But why are we doing this? What benefit is it really to compete and say, oh, I only slept four hours? It's not really a good thing. Even Ariana Huffington, who said, oh, yes, uh, I only sleep four hours, has now come out and said, maybe I was exaggerating. I think 12 hours is perfect. Do as much as you can. So anyway, just to summarize, I'm asking us to examine society. I think um, Eagle's words at the beginning of this, examine your deeds, rouse yourself from your slumber. I think it's really important because let's look at what society is making us do. And I am blaming society. I'm, bla I, I'm, not, I, you know, I'm blaming capitalistic uh, situation here, you know, where we have to have test after test after test, how we are so encouraged to strive for promotion. You know, we talked about the diet culture earlier. None of this is new. Keeping up with the Joneses isn't new, but social media is obviously exacerbating that. So I'm just encouraging us all to reflect on those elements where we're pushing ourselves, what success really should mean for us. And do we, when we want to die, when we die, not when we want to die, when we die, do we want our gravestone to say, sent 2000 emails a day? Or do we want to say loved by family and friends? And I think for me, that was the turning point. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Helena. And again, thank you for uh, sharing and saying thank you for making it so personal. Thank you for sharing your story. And uh, I think such a lesson for all of us in it. Um, I um, unfortunately have to say that it is better for us uh, to have only one contribution now, either on Zoom, people, or uh, in the sanctuary. Would anybody want to um, say, say something? Uh, yes, please. Can I ask you to come to this microphone, please? Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, I, I'm a retired GP, and, and a few years ago, there was, a, there was a minister who decided to give some money to educate GPs. And in South London, there was a psychologist who was helping GPs. And he wrote a book, which was The Good Enough GP. Because as GPs, we're always worried that we're not good enough. And we're all striving for excellence. And what he pointed out, and this was really so important, actually what, the, what GPs were doing was good enough, that they were in fact providing a really good service. And that then reflects on family life and how far we are good enough in the family as well. That's it. Thank you. That's that's. I mean, it's so I wish I wish I could have spoken to you before I'm writing <laughs> writing the book because it would have been really fascinating to hear a perspective from the medical industry. Um, thank you for your for your contribution. I couldn't agree more. Absolutely. Yes. Thank you. And um, I just uh, wanted to bring this session for, uh, to a close and uh, say that we are. Um, we will continue all our services in about 15 or 20 minutes with uh, Yizkor and, oh, sorry, with Musaf, with an additional service. Um, and at the very end of uh, Yom Kippur, we will say the key formula, Adonai Hu Elohim. And this will be the last, or one of the last phrases, or uh, things we say and there are two attributes of God 
that we have in Judaism. There are more, but there are two main attributes. One is Adonai, and it is normally the attribute of justice, of, uh, oh, the other way around. It, it is the attribute of mercy. Yes, Adonai is, sorry, thank you. Uh, Adonai is the attribute of mercy, that's right, of mercy and compassion. And the other one is Elohim, and that's God, which is normally uh, associated with justice. And many of us think of God as something one, uh, and as only one of these attributes, either justice or compassion. And on Yom Kippur, we say, and indeed, every single time we say Shema, Adonai Eloheinu, the God of justice, is the same God as the God of compassion. And we do try to bring these two elements together on Yom Kippur. And we try to put, to live in harmony. And I think this word, harmony, is the key word for, uh, for us today. And the words which I hear from all three speeches. And um, thank you so much. And we'll, we'll have a 15 minute break now. And we will resume uh, in half past two. Thank you very much to all contributors.